reaction to meeting the hero's trajectory within the chronotope of Alexei Balabanov's book. Um, and since we only have two, we're going to be flexible with time, so okay. the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, right, so uh, the paper, uh, as evident from the from its name, will be focusing on uh, uh, the uh, chronicles of Alexei Balabanov's book, and specifically as it expresses itself through characters' movement from the province to the capital and a movement's contribution to the construction of meaning. And just for the convenience sake, uh, I will be primarily focusing on the most iconic films, uh, Brother and Brother 2, along with uh, 2007's Carter to Hungary, and the last uh, film, uh, Me Too, that was uh, finished in 2012. Uh, Bakhtin defines, uh, suggests that time and space are intrinsically connected. Uh, and um, in, in the lim liminal time of Balabanov's film, it, mat uh, it materializes, thickens, as Bakhtin says, takes on flesh, become artistically visible in the ambiguous and unsettled provincial space that pervades the physical limits of the province. In tracing the hero's journey through the chronotype of Balabanov's film, I will employ Julia Kristeva's idea of the deject uh, to signify his connection to the discourse of objection and to describe the hero through his otherness. The image of the deject, as Kristeva writes, the one by whom the abject exists, that uh, she conjures in her powers of horror and his relationship with the abject in my view, effectively summarizes Balabanov's hero. His sense of self is undermined by the fluidity of his universe. He is greatly dependent on the incessant movement within his surroundings, directing his search for identity and expression toward demarcating the ever-shifting boundaries. The forced repetitiveness of hero's movement and the slowdown of time, visually represented by Balabanov's trademark walks and drives that interrupt the action, serve as expression of a peculiar state of impasse that encompasses the post-Soviet and today's Russia. In conclusion, I will outline the overarching visual and narrative motif of a vertical vector forming within the chronotop of the films, facilitating the direction of the hero's movement within the space and resulting in the ultimate refusal inability to follow the vertical axis. Uh, Lev Aninsky, in reviewing uh, Yuri Uday, uh, wrote, The spirit reaches up, but unsupported, stumbles over, and soars again. And to me, it's, uh, it, it was inspirational in uh, application to Balbanus and Elvis as well. Although St. Petersburg, as a focal geographical point, looms large in Balbanus films, I argue that ultimately, the entire chronotop uh, is that of a geographical and cultural province. As Russia, in its continuous undergoing of troubled times, positions itself in its social cultural expressions as an outsider, a provincial space vis a vis both Europe and Asia. In rephrasing Daniel, Daniel Dandre's assertion, for Balabanov, the world outside the province doesn't exist. With few exceptions, the historical time of Balabanov's films is clearly identified, even insisted upon, be it 1905, 1917, second half of 1984, or the wild 90s. The time of Balabanov's film, much as his own, is a time of historical shift, a dramatic and disorienting dissolution of the familiar with the established societal relationship and boundaries shifting, becoming fluid, giving way to the liminal time of abjection. It's time after the old system begins to disintegrate, but before the new meaning is born out of decomposing God. And the God, as the lower stratum, is where the transformation occurs and is the provincial home of Balbanov's characters. And just as clearly stated chronology reveals the ambiguity of time, the space, and especially provincial space, while clearly marked with town signs, railroad stations, internally refuses definition. 
The Grand Top of Films in its entirety rejects centralization and thus refusing, refuses to take a defined shape. In effort to define its boundaries, the hero breaches them, attempting to establish meanings and anchor himself with a new reforming universe. As a specific place, the province can be uh, defined through its relationship to the capital. But with the disintegration of the Soviet Union in its centralized institution, it further, further the distancing of province from the capital. And the centripetal movement toward the capital, uh, Moscow usually, in search of identity that was central to your earlier Soviet films, ceased, became chaotic and repetitive. Post-Soviet provincial time, uh, I mean, uh, post-Soviet provincial space exists outside the currents of time, a hermetic, ambiguous, unformed, non-subject, uh, a leper colony of source, to use a Blavatic metaphor. Castle betrayed by the capital and itself indifferent to the capital. In contemporary Russian cinema, and this is a uh, screenshot from My Joy, Sergei uh, Lazinza, from Yuri's Day to My Joy, from Temporary Drum to The Hope Factory, province seemed to appear as a dark, enveloped and folk labyrinth of a space, impossible to escape. In itself, a Leviathan consuming the unsuspected outsiders and locals alike. Uh, alike. While in Morphe, Balbanov is allowing for provincial abject to consume the Muscovite doctor. More often than not, the director injects the provincial abject into the ordered space of the capital, degrading the capital standing as uh, the center of power. And uh, in the finale of Blind Man's Bluff, or Zmorki, um, the entire misfit band of provincial gangsters settles down in an office with a view of the Kremlin. <coughs> the movement of Balabanas here toward the capital begins largely as an impulse. In the opening scenes of uh, Brother, along with Happy Days, Trifim, and a Freaks and Men, and even War to some degree, the hero is cast upon the screen from a thotic, amorphous nothingness with little or no memory of his earlier existence. The act of his arrival is an act of breaching a boundary, both narratively and structurally, perfectly expressed in the opening scene of Brother. Danila, the killer who claims to be savior in the words of Kristeva, climbs up onto the screen from the swampy woods below and interrupts a production of a video for Wings. Danila's past is tinged with uncertainty and ambiguity. Even his own address suggests transience, Vagzalina Ulitsa. The Nautilus song, as a poetic expression of an individual reflective experience, acts as a catalyst for a spontaneous yearning, an obsession of sorts, that sends reflection free Danila on an identity quest, parallel to the, the visit to his brother. Much of the hero movement within the narrative is spontaneously centrifugal or takes place in the, according to Logan, eccentric city of St. Petersburg. And in accordance with the Petersburg text, which Balabana firmly keeps an eye on, the borderland city is an illusory construct, not only for capital, but not a real city at all, a mirage. And the famous uh, quote of Andrea Belli, uh, if Petersburg does, uh, is not the, the capital, then there is no, no Petersburg. It only appears to exist. As a representation of the imperial state force, St. Petersburg seizes its function. Arriving to the city, Danila sees the rear end of the bronze horseman and turns the other way. <laughs> Unlike Pushkin's Evgeny, he wants or has nothing to do with the power of the capital. A similar scene plays out, <coughs> and just to in inject something that's not in there, it, in uh, the sober, uh, the entire uh, part of the uh, boiler room scene plays with, with uh, the sober back turned to a poster with uh, Peter the Great on it. So it's sort of a similar relationship between the imperial and the provincial. Uh, and the similar scene, the scene plays <coughs> out in Trophim and Garvey to Hungary. 
where the big city turns to the new arrival is abject sight, the blind alleys, pubs, and brothels. The non-subject liminal space extends beyond the province and into the capital. Balabana is often credited with creating uh, in the Neil of a growth, new cinematic hero for the new top time. It flashed out the guys of the 90s. Uh, and, uh, however, the Neela, at least in my view, has a long cinematic history. At his core, Balabana's hero is a grassroots provincial outsider, a direct descendant of the characters that populated Soviet screen from its early years when the revolution pushed to the forefront of history of fresh people, autonomous in respect to property, culture, history, or themselves. Apart from the larger Western historical cultural context, he emerges from the undivine, the non-subject. He breaches barriers demanded to be noticed. He literally, in the case of Trefim or Danila, walks in front of the camera demanding to be recognized. Not as a trembling creature, but the one who has to write. Unlike Raskolnikov, though, he is not driven by Napoleonic aspirations. Not to say that uh, Daniel Bagrov and incidentally less lethal but far more terrifying Captain Jurov of Target 200 are just as misguided in their approach. The collapse of the Soviet Union leaves the hero orphaned in a liminal state of an unfinished rite of passage. The loss of the myth of the communal brotherhood of nations is experienced by him as catastrophic. His child self is gone, having passed through the ritual dying in the war. Yet he hasn't become full adult and can be accepted or recognized as one of their own by his tribe. In the word, his perpetual strength, wandering along the margins with a sort of gun in hand. All the while, he is driven by the inherent yearning for the truth, which he attempts to immediately restore by the gun and the fist, and thus recapture the utopia of harmonious world. Paradoxically, the restoration of the harmonious imperial existence demands the presence of an enemy. So to be the nationwide brother, Danila needs the darkies. In the universe that he so desperately tries to restore and bring into balance and cohesion, he disintegrates into war, acquiring object qualities again. So in the end of uh, the film, and brother, his lover is ravaged, his brother tortured, and his friendship soiled. And Danila himself is repeatedly ejected or rejected from and by the world he's trying to harmonize. As a liminal persona, or a temple, he hasn't fully completed the rite of passage, and as such, he remains a tabula rasa. So upon this undefined surface of unformed self, he fashions various disguises, a provincial fool, nerd in glasses, army clerk, a first-class pa passenger and brother too, in splendid fedora, his true self remains not so much obscured as unformed. Ivan Skraven in The Stoker will later undergo a similar transformation, he, the treatment. His identity as a war hero matched by his costume only in the end as he undertakes his revenge and then a suicide. The erotic version of Balabanov's own getup, a carnivalesque costume that the Yakut actor Skraven sports throughout the film, seems to represent his otherness even to himself. <coughs> so, uh, for those who might not know, what he's wearing is what Balabana has been conventionally wearing throughout his uh, life on set. Um, the story of him, who in a, in a way retracts in the womb in the end of Happy Days, concludes with, this is me drawing. Trafim, as uh, you've seen earlier, peers into the Frenchman's camera in search of himself only to be edited out many years later. Even the, let's call them the villains, are looking for recognition and being disguised at the same time. Yogan, oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, that was before, uh, uh, is uh, disguised by his foreign name and black contact lenses worn by Makovetsky, which I sort of accidentally skipped, but uh, there you go. Azurov uh, Paulian, is deformed by real-life hernias. If uh, anybody saw Target 200, he has a little bit deformed stomach throughout the film, and it's not uh, a prop. It's the actual. He actually did have uh, a health issue that Balabanov became very excited about. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
the, um, the, the screen test for the role actually has him undressed with his uh, situation exposed. In his struggle to disengage himself from the abject surroundings and failing at it, Zhurov is not unlike Daniela. Balabanov's choice of the soundtrack is uh, ongoing and never accidental. Uh, he's attempted to cobble together his own small raft. With this effort, he devises his own mode of separation, unleashing the immemorial violence. But as he exercises ultimate control over bodies, dead or alive, of others, as an impotent, he cannot control his own. His small raft ends up being a soil bed with a pile of rotten bodies. The soft, childlike features of Daniela, Zhurov's incredibly Popeye-like melted face, if you, you remember the uh, Faulkner's description of Popeye, the uh, Pollyon's face resembles that character uncannily. Uh, and uh, Faulkner refers to Popeye's face as looking like a, a wax doll that's been left by fire for way too long. Um, Trip themes, uh, movie star visage that's obscured uh, by a uh, scruffy beard. Those are masks that are covering the un or malformed other, refusing possession and forcing the character to face the abject with this. But all this abjection and degradation is not without a purpose. According to Bakhtin, to degrade is to bury, to sow, and to kill simultaneously in order to bring forth something more and better. Does this carnivalous death rebirth occur within the films of Alexei Balabanov? Is there life-giving potential within the lower stratum? Moreover, is there high stratum in the opposing end of character's journey? As I mentioned earlier, each of the characters is striving to solidify himself through recognition and acceptance. The effort is often represented by the characters ascending to a higher plane in both physical and spiritual sense. This is Balabanov's early documentary from the history of art. Aristatics in Russia. Uh, Birgit Bumers, <laughs> in her essay to uh, Moscow to Moscow, notes the significance of vertical horizontal binary. Represent Kultura Gva by Vladimir Papirini, Bumers noticed that the centrifugal pattern is replaced by a centripetal one, and the vertical is replaced by the horizontal. She concludes, the hero of the 90s is afraid of heights and open space. He is deprived of the wings that would allow him to fly. Indeed, the steel wing for hands and throbbing engines for hearts of the Soviet era have been irrevocably lost along with the artifice of the imperial state and forged utopia and its vertical vector of centralization. To expand on this idea, I propose that Balabanov's hero uh, in general, and specifically Daniela, is actually drawn to, quote, Nodos Pompolos, to open windows and upper floors of a different kind of vertical. To the Soviet utopian vertical of centralized bright future, what apparently uh, sort of speaks well of, uh, where Moscow itself is often seen as the mythical city of sun of sorts, Balabanov kind of poses his own vision of ascension. This ascension <coughs> suggests a departure from endless mo movement of signification that the character is engaged in. In Balabanov's book, the vertical vector is the direction of the search for the individuality in opposition to collectivism of Soviet communal ideal. Within the narrative of the films, the vertical pattern of the movement of the hero is represented as an almost mythical place above, sometimes literally a higher floor in the building. Danila's love for Nautilus propels him into the higher strata. In the film, it assumes the physical shape of a higher floor in the building where his idol Gutus are celebrating with his and Balabanov's musician friends. Daniela runs up to the uh, runs, up, runs up the stairs to the apartment, and for a few minutes he is transported and transformed. From Daniela's point of view, this hangout is staged as cozy and almost heavenly antithesis to the not only hellish mix up below that Daniela is involved in, but also to a drug fuel house party early in the film. In opposition to the force brotherhood of men, state and force, or criminal, this is unity by personal choice. Daniela, as much as he desires to be part of it, 
is enabled to, enabled to fully ascend to this particular brotherhood. In Brother 2, Balabanov subverts Danilo's attempt at ascension. His upward movement along the Chicago fire escape is supported by, I found out that I have a large family mantra, but it concludes with infamous who has the power monologue. Of course, Danila loses what family he has and never really returns home. As he removes his final disguise of a first class passenger, the plane takes off. Nautilus Pompos uh, plays out with Goodbye America, where I haven't ever been. So it seems that Balbanov's America is a mirage, just like St. Petersburg or a stock in eccentric Moscow. Danila is flying home, but the screen fades to black before he ever lands. The year is left on the road, in limbo, his journey unresolved. The vertical vector formed from the chaotic chronic top of objection offers a new potential. However, the process stalls and closes onto itself without producing the birth of a new meaning. As soon as in his effort to separate and define himself, the hero reaches the high point, he is cast out into a lower subterranean, subterranean even strata, back to the provincial abject. In Cargo to Hungary, the anticlimactic demise of both Alexei with his impossible utopia and Zhurb with his impossible love, one in the dead end prison corridor, the other prosaically disposed with one shot, reaffirms the affinity of the two and the universality of the top. Like the twins, Toya and Kolya, they represent the say, positive negative dichotomy of the trend. So, with Balabanov, the line between good and evil. Is very thin. In a point and take on the Sievsky style duplicity, if one of the conjoined twins dies, the other will follow. In Me Too, Balabanov attempts to draw a conclusion to the journey that began with the Nila's quest for wins. The characters reverse the trajectory and leave St. Petersburg to arrive into the wintry zone. It's time for the symbolic ascent to be realized, but yet again, the hero is rejected along with his creator. Is this what Balabanov really leaves us with? Sonia begging on his knees, framed by the crumbling walls of the churchyard. The green shot, so rare in Balabanov's later films, is a reversal of sorts of the opening of Brother, reminiscent of the final scenes of Freaks and Men and Reef River. Only this time, the open space is excluded from the frame. The rapture didn't happen, and the metamorphoses are not complete. Is it so? Upon arriving into his zone, Tarkovsky's stalker says, here we are, home at last. Through eternal recurrence, the return becomes the rebirth, the transformation. The disintegrating village in Me Too is the beginning and the end of the journey, the place where the characters can begin to fully acknowledge and embrace each other. Matvey's choice to stay with his dad and the lads is a recognition of the cyclical nature of time and transformation. In the redundant and syncopated journey of Balabanov's hero from the entrails of the provincial town to the gut of St. Petersburg and back, the director attempted to form a subject from non-subject. In the process opposite to the one that occurs in Trofim, he edits his stray into the discourse of history. His characters struggle to identify the space of history as their own, just as the space rejects them and impels them to start afresh. In his return to the, his provincial origin, Origins in retracting from the upward bound vector and anchoring himself to the frozen ground, the hero faces the abject, and to quote Christian again, casting within himself the scalpel that carries out his separations, thus perhaps offering an opportunity for us to explore the nature of the force that casts off, ejects him. In films of Lexi Balabanov, we're offered an unflinching look into the heart of the abject post Soviet experience, but that also allows for shaping meaning within the most unlikely of places, a threshing soul of grassroots hero. That's it. Okay, um, I think the, the thing that I have prepared for today might be a bit long, so if I go away over time, mm -hmm. I will. Basically, I look at you one second, which was okay. the second movie, and then if there's still time, just nod if not, okay. I'll, I'll finish. Okay. Um, so, the paper I'm presenting today is part of my larger research project um, on the epistemological implications of the beginning of the space age. 
and hopefully it's also an exploration of the concept of province and the provincial in the Russian context. So today I'm going to try to offer a reading of this, um, these two dimensions through three contemporary Russian films by Cosmos, which is an interesting category actually approved by Cosmos, which is a collection of all of the um, cinematography done in the Soviet Union and in um, post Soviet Russia about the space age. Um, so I'm going to argue that in, the, in these films, the province seems to, seems to be tied to the notion of subjectivity or particular facets of subjectivity in a very performative, case-specific sense, um, rather than either to uh, landscape or identity as a complete, absolute whole. Um, so firstly, in order to get you guys where my starting point actually is, I'll, I'm going to have to go and say a bit about the context, about, about what I mean about the, what I mean when I say we're going to be talking about the dawn of the space age. Um, so the dawn of the space age, namely the first examples of man-made satellites and manned spaceflight in the mid-20th century, may be seen as an event with a capital E in the most dramatic sense of the word, an event of discourse which postulates the subject that landed on the moon or went to space in a more general sense, um, and the subject that is man does not necessarily have to be man. It was not corporeality that made the moon landing possible, but rather, according to Jacques Lacan, mathematical discourse. So Lacan was not the only one to note that the space age, uh, that the dawn of the space age should be taken seriously, not on the level of terrestrial politics, geography, or not even on the level of human imagination. Rather, the moon landing, landing for um, Lacan, or in fact any of the events that may be considered as sign, signposts of the dawn of the space age of the late 50s and early 60s of the 20th century, can serve as evidence that being a subject, even a human subject, does not coincide with anything anthropomorphic at all. Subjectivity stems from the signifier which keeps on pounding on the door of the amorphous, irrational, and unattainable real that is driven toward it, yet always doomed to fail in reaching it. These failures, on the other hand, are what constitutes reality, its gist, its perks, the life of it, in a very literal sense. Uh, so, of course, if we take this interpretation of the dawn of the space age, we end up in a difficult uh, position. In order to internalize it, we have to acknowledge that we are robbed of our ego, or everything that makes us proud of actually being human. However, it is possible to argue that this aspect of the dawn of the space age persists in all of the interpretations of this event, despite all of the interpreters' efforts to erase it, to rationalize it, to show that the dawn of the space age was just a rad uh, rational continuation of uh, politics, technological pro progress, you name it, by other means. So uh, today I'll proceed to discuss three of such interpretations that appeared in contemporary Russian cinematography, by which I mean uh, films shot post-2001. Um, usually, post-Soviet films on outer space um, get interpreted as nostalgia for the Soviet future or for one of the constitutive myths of Soviet identity, the myth of supremacy in outer space. But I will insist today that it also lends itself to another, perhaps polemic, but arguably also a productive reading. And furthermore, I'll try to demonstrate that in these Russian and contextually specific late reinterpretations of the dawn of the space age, what emerges um, in, in this chronotope is a phantom-like image of the Russian province in the richest understanding of the term possible, as a characteristic um, state of mind that, uh, that creates a universe determined by a special ambiguous relation between the metropolis, the capital, and everything else, a relation that is needed to keep this everything else going, but which is also, to a certain extent, a burden. So, um, this is one, my statement one would be that um, if the distance into outer space is the core axis of an imaginary, if this is the unattainable center strived for by official ideology, then the rest, everything else, ends up being the rest. And in the context of Russian cinematography, the rest tends to spell out, in certain cases, the province, in the particular Russian sense of the word, as a particular dynamic between the individual, the environment, and nature in a more abstract sense, and the capital, also in an abstract sense, meaning all of the idea, ideas that it embodies in a specific case, not just, not necessarily just the people it gives to work and shelter to. So how does this happen? Is there, a, um, specific, is there a general pattern? I would say it happens differently every time. And today I'll look closely 
at three, if I have the time, interesting feature films. Um, first, the Alexei Uchitsev's Cosmos Kapitulstvia, which was um, not too precisely translated into English as Dreaming of Space. Then Fedorchenko's Kerma and Munyev, First Man on the Moon, and Alexei German Vladshe's Bumajna Soldat, the Paper Soldier. I'll argue that the prevalent chronotopes of the films um, revolve around three dimensions, which also bring out three particular um, um, three particular aspects of the so-called post-Soviet province. I'll argue that Uchitev's film Kosmos Kapitulstvia is preoccupied with the subject, Fedorchenko is preoccupied with memory, and Germans may be seen, German juniors may be seen as a pre preoccupation with the national idea. Um, basically, all of the three films are preoccupied with the beginning of the space age, so the time um, directly preceding the first cases of manned space flight in uh, the Soviet context. Now, let's begin with Uchitev's Dreaming of Space. Um, the narrative of this melancholic stylist account of the 50s in an obscure town in the Russian north is simple. What we get is a glimpse into the life of two men, their relations with two women, and their involvement in the cosmonaut training program. One of the men, German, which is an allusion to German Tov, who was supposed to make the first flight, but was substituted by Gagarin at the very end, he's a, he's a highly motivated fellow who's apparently a bit too intelligent for his own good. He's studying English, and he's apparently trying to find a way out of the USSR, either by ship or his spaceship, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another guy picks up his, on his uh, space enthusiasm. This is a more simple-minded creature that goes by the name of Kanyok. Um, in English, they translated this as horsey, which I don't think is uh, too accurate either. So he is a cook in a local restaurant, in a menza. Now, my interpretation of the film would, allow, would align both of these men into one subject, because they cannot, they do not function one um, without the other. Um, well, they don't function well together either, but they do manage to give them to drive the film forward. So the director, Uchitev, engages several, several different tools in order to make this happen, to create this double-headed subject, the heads facing the same goal, but the feet pulling them in different directions. So how does this happen? I think there are several techniques, um, but let's start at the beginning. So the film shows a highly stylized version of a coastal town in the north of the USSR in 1957, right after the launch of the Sputnik. Now, the mise-en-scene mise uh, could function as a mechanism that makes it easier for the spectator to identify themselves with a certain character, but in this case, this is only possible if we take up my proposed reading that the two protagonists should function as one, as, um, as the, the one single subjectivation gesture of the film. Because individually, they appear as static and flat, and it would be safe to say that we're not dealing with Brechtian uh, deep so, uh, psychologization, psychologization at, at work here. Um, so my insistence on the fact that they form one entity, even when their paths separate, is supported by the very movement of the camera, the, uh, the gaze of the camera. Throughout the first uh, half of the film, the camera actually seems to follow Konyok, uh, who is following this intrig intriguing stranger, German. And around halfway through the film, um, the point of view changes, actually, and the camera starts glancing at both cameras from the side in medium shots. Now, in the last third of the film, however, we get a very apparent turn of the gaze. There is a tracking shot, which is following someone who is dressed like German, um, suddenly, and this shot is suddenly followed by a medium close-up that shows up the person on face. And the person we see is not German, but, surprise, surprise, Kanyok, who is merely dressed up in German's clothing. Now, we could argue that this is an enactment of the constitutive split of the subject. This argument would be reinforced, uh, reinforced by what follows. It's a long shot de depicting both characters, which we see through the window of, um, of a train. Mm, sorry about that. Um, of a tram. So um, we, see this, uh, we see both characters through the window of a tram, and the glass seemingly solidifies the image of the two men, who are now wearing very similar clothes, and who exchange a secret. But at this point, both the spectator and one of the men, namely German, uh, know that this secret is actually a lie. So German claims he's training to become the first cosmonaut, although this is complete fiction. By this time, we know that he's barely trying, that he's merely trying to escape from the USSR. 
Now, apart from the gaze of the camera, there are other circumstances that reinforce the split and this illogical unity embodied by Gerwin and Kanyok. The first are the curiosities of the storyline, the, the fabula, which seem to drive the socialist realist canonical logic of irrational connections which amount to something akin to an event to the extreme. So Kanyok, first of all, has no idea at the beginning of the film who German is, what this mysterious persona does, why he studies foreign languages, why he practices boxing, and why he regularly swims in the ice-cold sea. Despite all of this, he makes a blind decision, as advised by his boxing coach, in fact, that will, he will be his friend, and that he will follow him around everywhere he goes. Now, German's lack of enthusiasm about this does not make Kanyok reconsider his um, decision, nor does the fact that German actually seduces his girlfriend. <laughs> um, what Kanyok does is basically just end up with the girlfriend's um, sister and continue, <laughs> go on into relationship with her. So meanwhile, the camera insists, long shots that show the coast, the bridge, which is a common meeting place, <coughs> In the forest, where Kanyok often falls off his bike with a girl in the back seat, and they proceed to roll around in the autumn leaves. Um, all of this is consistently fuzzy and unclear. Medium shots, on the other hand, are always in motion. They shake, they shift, they slide. So the subject is kind of caught somewhere between these extremes. We capture it in the middle medium long shot, not as a st stabilization or a clarification of the image, but as a mock-up, like. A mock-up like Kanyok, who is just a caricature of uh, German when he takes up his idol, idol's dressing habits. So he does not become German by dressing up like, like him. He merely becomes this inefficient replica, a repetition. So evidently the split that I've just described is not just a split of one personality, but the constitu constitutive split that marks the way the film is driven forward, the way it works. It is also discernible on the level of the relationship between the sound and the visual aesthetics of the film. Most of the music, most of the soundtrack is diegetic, which, is, which might be an allusion to the socialist realist tradition of Soviet cinematography. Um, now, most of the music heard in the film comes from radio transmitters on the set. And wherever, um, uh, wherever there is music the source of which cannot be traced down as easily, such as the music accompanying uh, the closing two credits, it is thematically directly linked to the ideas elaborated in the movie, such as the one which seems to be driving the plot, which might be the myth of the so Soviet um, idea of supremacy in outer space. However, it is not really the presence or the functions of the music in this particular film that are striking. What strikes most is the loudness. Compared to the spoken words, um, the dialogue, the music is exceptionally loud and sounds kind of forced into the shots. The dialogue, on the other hand, seems to have been muted intentionally so that it is unclear and muffled. And this stylization, which foregrounds the music, creates a remarkable contrast between the visual and the sonic images and the, and the, spoke, and the spoken word. And I would also say it could be extended to a contrast between technology on the one hand and the ambient that it intrudes to on the other. Um, all of these techniques that I, I've just outlined in this particular movie could be summed up as excess. But this excess does not really culminate in any kind of catharsis. So there's this buildup of different, excess, different techniques excessively used to demonstrate something that looks kind of artificial. But there's nothing uh, that breaks this logic. And therefore, it kind of makes little sense interpreting this film through either a progressive or a purely deconstructionist uh, matrix. I would say we need both to kind of follow the dynamics of the subject. Uh, because it is through the subject that the film still manages to produce a sense of unity, which was recognized in the critiques it received. And I would argue it could be described as a certain dynamic of a post-Soviet kind of take on the provincial um, subject. So this, is, uh, this would be my interpretation of the first film. And around the same time, actually just a year after Uchitsu's Dream in Your Space came out, we saw uh, Fedorchenko's first man, man on the moon, moon that made it to the cinemas. Now, this is a mockumentary of uh, what was allegedly a Soviet space program in the 1930s. And the main um, tactic employed by the director in this movie um, could be named as a type of postmodernist deconstructive reconstruction of a memory. 
I would argue that what the film mocks, uh, what it is a mockumentary about, is not uh, the Soviet space program per se, but rather the memory of it, the myths produced and reproduced by it. Here it seems that the, the movie, which is also um, driven by an explicit frustration over outer space, employs most of its capacities to play around with space and time in order to focus on memory. Uh, memory is kind of a shady concept, but I would insist for the purpose of this interpretation. So the, me the memory of the mythical Soviet space program. What actually happens um, if we follow the narrative, we follow researchers who follow the unreliable evidence of the existence of a certain space program in the 30s and of um, so-called cosmopilot, cosmopilot uh, Harlamov's flights to the moon, which accidentally ended somewhere in Chile. Um, so the film abuses shots from the archives and uh, a certain neutral um, tone of narration, which we're familiar with from, um, I don't know, natural scientific documentaries. Um, as well, and it also employs construed testimonies of fake witnesses to tell about what seems to be uh, like a logical gap that had to be taken before the guidance flight in 1957. Now, many spectators, if we follow the critiques, were actually convinced that the director, director tried to make fun of the history of spaceflight, and some thought that he was trying to do the very opposite, to elevate it to the level of myth. But both sets of uh, critiques agree that whatever he was doing, he didn't really do it too well. Which is <laughs> um, um, well, from this, we could kind of conclude that if the film actually could have succeeded in doing something well, and I would actually say that it is really uh, convincing in, in this respect, uh, was creating this um, idea, this feeling of all pervasive confusion. On the one hand, it seems to be a bit more too, too, a bit too straightforward for what might be, I don't know, Western expectations of post-Soviet better humor. And on the other hand, it is in its comedy. Um, it is a bit. It might be a bit too unbelievable for the Russian spectators who expected it to be, you know, a comical take on the history of spaceflight. So up until the, the end, the very end, the, the movie sticks to the form of the documentary. The persistent historic, the historian digging in the archives and following the object of research, regardless of the absurdities and the logical elements that tend to undermine the thesis at the beginning. The film manages to create a liminal time space. It is not yet in the realm in the realm of unbelievable parody, and it is no longer a serious conspiracy theory. This aspect of the form of the film seems to mirror the irrational, blind persistence that was at work to an extent before the actual beginning of the space age. This blind persistence that created the possibilities, the conditions, albeit not, not always the best ones, for people, certain people, to stick to patterns of behavior that might at one point bring results, although not necessarily, which might bear something exceptional, meaning, in, the, in our case, spaceflight. I'm alluding to Tsiolkovsky, who was, for the most, for the, a large part of his life, considered to be a lunatic, uh, who didn't really know what he was doing, but he kept doing it, I mean, he kept, kept striving um, to create the conditions to go to outer space on the level of mathematics, in any case. So the film focuses on this confusion behind the space age, the confusion that was one of the crucial elements for the dynamics of the whole program before it actually started, um, I would say. There is, for example, a telling sequence where there are horsemen which are riding up to the rocket before it gets launched, and their helmets are as if pointing to the absurdity of the entire um, endeavor. Now, Fedorchenko's film, with, or starts off, which starts off with confusion, doesn't really offer a way out of it. Confusion and blind faith in fairy stories um, are kind of the dynamics of memory when the latter is dictated by the central, by a central task which is to be executed and then allows to trickle down to the periphery. Um, now the most comfortable exit would be humor, but in this particular case, um, the Russian spectator, or the spectator who believed in the myth of, I don't know, the uh, the greatness of the Soviet space program, will have to pay a very high price for, uh, for this humor. Um, the film exploits the, convention of the conventions of the documentary and all of their richness, often providing testimonies of the first Soviet uh, cosmopilot who allegedly flew to the moon, had an accident in, uh, in Chile, and was admitted to a psychiatric ward in Chita, 
and then ended his career playing the part of Alexander Nevsky in a circus. So his colleagues from the crew of potential cosmopilots, the constructor of the first rocket, one of the cameramen following them around, instructed by the secret services, then uh, an employee from the psychiatric ward and psychiatric ward in Chita. All of them are really enthusiastic respondents to the questions posed by the film crew. At the beginning, there is um, a person from the archives who says that everything that happened here got recorded. And if it got recorded, it had to be true. Um, this is uh, basically the inauguration to, the, to the, the whole movie. I would say that humor here neutralizes the confusion generated by, by the film, but as I said, there is, there is a price for this. We have to acknowledge that the characters involved in this burlesque are also exceptionally funny. For example, the ex-potential cosmopilot Fatakov, who is an orphan raised with love by the Soviet, uh, by the Soviet people, um, I'm quoting from the movie, and now working as a guard at the zoology museum surrounded by huge model insects. He is kind of comical in a way. Then there is a midget who is also a potential cosmopilot and is now a performer at the midget circus where he is filmed by the, uh, by the film crew right after the show, so with lipstick and and powdered cheeks and so on. So we're dealing with the deconstruction of a myth about a myth, which is humorous, but allows no empathy whatsoever, which is kind of the flip side of the coin. The carnival here appears to be permanent. permanent. The carnival is the, dynamics, uh, the dynamic of the film. The visuals are accompanied by Soviet patriotic songs from various periods and Soviet sci-fi beeps from sci-fi beeps from, I don't know, the 60s, 70s. The shots, on the other hand, are another mashup of sorts. There is historical data which is uh, shown alongside pseudo-documentary montage, and there are shots out of Soviet space films. The only film which is um, tellingly shown to be, shown undeniably to be fiction, is uh, the Soviet sci-fi Kosmichisky race from 1936, which also deals with the possibility of flying to the moon. So the only firm anchor of the film is therefore, ironically, fiction which does not, in, in postmodern terms, uh, replace reality, which is lost and perhaps never was there, but which appears as an image which points to the void behind the, the, the closed curtains. So there is nothing really there. This is why the affirmatively uh, fictional shots from Kosmichisky race are important. They kind of guarantee that there is at least something to be trusted, at least some, some of the fiction is actually truly fictional. Other shots mainly maneuver between fiction and reality, such as the shots of the cameras supervising the, the cosmopilots. There are even excerpts from advertisements for these cameras in the movie, which makes the entire film even more uncanny, because everything seems contrived. So this is a documentary based on stage fake evidence. I would say that the film presents the dynamics of uh, the myth of the Soviet space program as confused, contrived, and as a product which is greatly conditioned by the tension between the center, the ideas uh, supported by it, and the periphery of the dynamics which actually transport them there. Um, I also have a third movie. Do you think I can go on to do it, or should we just Did you have clips? Um, I can show clips, so maybe um, I have clips from these two movies, and then I have another interpretation. Of it. Okay, so what's important is there's supposed to be sound here where the guys behind the camera go, Zepisal? That. So Zepisal, and this is like really important <laughs> because it points to that everything has to be recorded. Um, 
Yeah, I also have a clip from uh, the first movie I was talking about, so Cosmos Capricciusque with English subtitles, and maybe I'll show it just for the people who are not familiar with the, with the film to see what the, the stylization of um, my body is. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, interesting about this the second part of the clip is that uh, German actually seduces the girl after he finds out that she has access to the port and she could, you know, give him a way out of the Soviet Union. Whereas the film, the visual aesthetics might make it seem without the dialogue that there's actually an intimate relationship going on. So it's another nice contrast. Okay.